I thought it's really, I mean, this is supposed to be about the last 50 years. Well, I'm going to cheat a bit because I'm going to add it a couple of years on because the story really starts with Kingsdale Master Cave. But I thought we'd better lead up to it first. So basically, this is the lead up in Dell's Caving to 1966. John Birkbeck, the hero of Yorkshire exploration, he bottomed Allen Pot in 1948. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? Fire long churn, I've tell you. And he also got 200 feet down Gaping Gill. And then along comes Martel. <laughs> anyway, we'll brush over Martel, because he didn't stay around long. <laughs> and then the YRC took up the cudgels, because they'd actually been pipped to the post. They were planning to go down. So the YRC uh, were really involved in the first golden age of cave exploration in the Dales. They explored all the open shafts and caves they could find. And especially Gaping Gill. They found several miles down Gaping Gill. That carried on until they came, of course, the more difficult stuff. Hence the siege of Mere Gill, which, as you see, took quite a while, four years. But then when you consider what they were using, rope ladders and bolt clothes and uh, candles, <laughs> Not bad going. Then the next big breakthrough, really, I think, was White Scar Cave, 1923. And it, but again, the exploration carried on beyond that. And then again, another big epic, Lost Johns, the YRC finally got down to the Master Cave in 1928. So you can see it was a lot of progress to start with and then steady progress moving on. 1930 to 55. Swinstow Hall was explored by the Gritstone Club in 1930. And then another massive breakthrough was Henschler's extensions to Gaping Gill. Because by now, we're having winch meets down Gaping Gill. So the access was easy, twice a year. <laughs> or once a year, I think, actually, at this time. Then Simpson's Pot in 1940. We're now into the era of underground adventure. If you haven't got it, Go and buy it and read it. Fantastic book. Then the next big breakthrough was Mossville Caverns, 1941. This is Mr. Leakey, the man who was immune to water and cold and everything. I think briskly he didn't really have much. I think he switched his brain off. And we'll come on to Mossville again later. Next big breakthrough, Lancaster Hall, 1946. And then this was also, these Gill Caverns were found at the other end. And then a lot of work was carried on to try and link the two together. I be found Caverns in 1949. But this was really the last hurrah of the BSA. Because at this time, because of political problems, the BSA basically smashed in half. The Lancaster half became the Red Rose. The Yorkshire half became the Northern Pennine Club, which is why suddenly... Northern Pennine Club, Pennigan Pot. It was the same people, but they were now called the Northern Pennine Club. And they had another siege down Pennigan Pot. And finally, the CPC linked Providence Pot to Dow Cave via Dalbergill Passage in 1954. So that brings us up to where we are now. It's all in this book. Pen and Underground, 1965. See how thick it is? And how big it is, right. This is what happened in the next 20 years or so. But that's part one. Part two, same size. Part three. See? That sums it up. <coughs> there was this, <coughs> there was an exploration in, an explosion in exploration. Up until then, exploration hadn't stopped, but it seriously slowed down. People were finding stuff. So, I mean, we found Marble Sink and Southern Scales Pot before we hit this one. But, um, and I'll tell you how it came about. I'm going to relate a few stories. How it came about was 
we started doing surveys of areas where we couldn't find many good surveys. So we're doing one in Chapeldale, we're doing one at Allen Pot, and we're doing one in Kingsdale. So we were actually, we surveyed Swinstow, we surveyed Simpsons to the final chamber here. And a member of our club, who was actually caving with another club, during a drought, he found a very low, wet passage leading off the final chamber. And he went through this passage and dropped into a canal. But nobody else would follow him. None of his, his mates, in fact, when he went back into the, into the, chamber, the final chamber, they were all on their way out. In fact, they were pulling the ladder up. <laughs> and he tried, he tried to get back two or three times to have a look at this passage. And then he said, well, you might as well go and survey this canal, because it's probably where the Kingsdale water is. Because what you have here is you have two 400-foot deep pots joining together, and then you've got the round pot further over here, and they all end up at about the same depth. But strangely enough, according to our survey, all the depths seem to be about 15 feet above Keld Head, which I thought, well, it's an error. You know? The surveys are out. Anyway, so down we go to have a look at this canal. And um, now the drought's finished. And water is pouring. The re you can see why nobody found this thing before, because water is absolutely belting through the roof of this bedding plane. And Alan, who had a, my brother over there, <laughs> who had an electric lamp, he was pushed into this thing to see if it went. And off he went, and then it gone. No sign of him. So basically, I pinched another electric lamp from somebody else and followed him. And I found him sitting on the edge of this trench with his feet dangling in the water. Because remember, it was in flood, so the water was about two foot deep, three foot deep. And the water was green because we put fluorescein into Routon Pot before we went down, because we thought we'd come across it in this canal. Well, we did come across it, but a bit later. Anyway, so now we found this amazing bit of passage. Yeah? And now, as uh, Frank was saying this morning, it's about uh, 16 miles long, the whole thing, linked through to the other side of the the uh, East Kingsdale as well. This gives you the whole thing. But a lot of the length has been added by diving, as you can see since. This is Gragoroth Mountain. This is the King's of Survey as we found it then. As you can see, they extended a lot since then. This is Ivyfell Cavern that Frank was talking about earlier on. This is Lost John's system over here. The East Gill system is way over here, like us to hold East Gill. And I gave a talk at the BSA conference in 67. And I was, what I was saying was, if there's a dry passage here in Kingsdale, above all the sump levels, and you've got this big passage here in Ivyfell Cavern, which obviously looks as if it came from over here somewhere, it looks like there's going to be dry passage all the way around. And that was the idea of the three county system. Anyway, for three, four years, nothing much happened. But everybody knew that, you know, there was plenty of stuff to be found, especially on Lake Fell. And then suddenly, bang, bang, the Happy Wanderers found this. Pipping pop. This is, this is his gill, as you can see, right? And this is the Lancaster Hall main drain going through East Gill up here, Lancaster Hall down here. So this was found in 1970, and this was found in 1971. So uh, uh, basically a two-year stroke, you've suddenly got a big chunk of the three counties coming through. Looking good. OK. The idea of this is to give you some flavor of what was going on at the time. By 1967, easy passages to find in Kingsdale were slowing down. The only way to find new stuff now was either to go diving or to scale things or to do some serious digging. And I never did much serious digging, really. 
So what I did was I went for a walk around Ingleborough to look at the blank areas we hadn't looked at before. Set off from Ingleton, crossed Lead Mines Moss, looking, going down things, and then finally came to the blank area between Mere Gill and Lead Mines Moss, area called Black Shiver, which is really just a wasteland, nothing there, except the climb down here, right? Okay. And the water then sinks and vanishes under here. And there was a choked up bedding plain, choked up with shingle stuff, right? And I basically dug through this lot and dropped back into the streamway, went downstream, and a pitch. Went back out, bivouacked under the wall at Mirgill for the night, carried on rounding over, looked at a few more holes. So the next weekend, back with a bunch of mates, and we spent some ladder, of course, because <laughs> we knew this could be quite a deep pot, and then started down these pictures. And the way we work is, if you've got a team with you, you take turns in going down the pictures to enter the glory. So that was my pitch. And there was, somebody else had that one, somebody else had that one, somebody else had that one, and then I got this one. <laughs> <clears throat> Which I think is quite fitting, really. <laughs> so we only had enough ladder to get down to here. Traverse across onto this thumping great block. I got to this block and looked around for a stone and dropped it. And it was quiet for a long time. And then there was this faint bong. So I thought, I'll drop another one and time it this time. Remember? Half GT squared. So off it goes. I thought, oh, between three and four seconds. So we, we got out of the pot, and I was doing the calculations. And everybody says, are you sure you've timed this thing right? You might be a second out, you know, which makes a big difference, you know? Anyway, back we came with more ladder, and uh, it turned out to be a monster. The whole pitch is 260 feet. And again, it was my pitch. So I got to the bottom first, marched off down this passage, and it sumped. And I was so annoyed, I dived into it. And, and, and amazingly, it went. <laughs> Came out the other side, and it, was, it turned out it was held up by a, quite a big shingle bank. So I dug away the shingle bank so the others could get through. And then uh, off we went, down this last pitch, and then into this sumpy area. Now, we surveyed quite a lot of it on the way out. And then um, the bottom bit needed surveying because we'd only surveyed from here, up and out. So I got a, me and Alan got a team of youngsters, basically, who got to con them into going down this hole. So three of them came with us, and we, down we went. Me and Alan went down first to carry on surveying down here. And there were three of them at the top here, and one of the people in this group was Paul Everett, and one of the, Martin Rogers said to Paul Everett, I think it's beginning to flood. So Paul, I don't know, again, I think like Leakey must have had his brain removed, because he decided to come down and tell us. <laughs> so down he comes, comes down this passage, appears at the top of this pitch, pop, shouts, but it, the water was making too much noise. So down he comes to tell us, and just as he's telling us it's flooding, there's this roar like an express train and the water hits the far wall of this chamber. Just comes roaring out of the passage. Absolutely incredible, yeah? Um, anyway, we were stuck down here for, uh, well, by the time we got out, it was almost 24 hours. <laughs> and uh, back on the surface, there was a mate of mine in his, in his little tent. Um, and he said to us, um, you know that some of our mates are down Mossdale at the time. And Obviously, I said, well, they're either going to be all right or they're not, because they're all bloody fantastic cavers. <clears throat> I said, if they're not, there's nothing we can do. And if they are all right, they'll get themselves out or they'll send somebody out. And it, that's what it turned out to be. So <clears throat> a day or so later, we were over there, you know, doing what we could, etc. Um, 
But uh, that was a very sad business. But it wasn't really the end of it because um, the coroner decided that the cave should be sealed as a grave. But he wouldn't let us basically go down and bury them or anything like that. And the parents got rather upset, rather upset about all this, as you can might imagine. And we kept saying, well, why don't you? Because the cave had been sealed with concrete. Here, the entrance but it's possible to get in through Leakey's old entrance. And people were going in. So the parents were getting more and more upset. Um, anyway, eventually we decided to cut the Gordian knot, and we just went down and buried them, basically. And, we, and then later we made a, an easier entrance, because Leakey's entrance is pretty lethal, really. The slightest drop of rain, and you're in trouble there. Yeah. Anyway, there's one more Mossdale story. There's, as you can see with Mossdale, I mean, it's a fantastic place, really. The ends of these passages are all pointing into the unknown. The water comes in here, and then it ends up three miles away over there in Wharfdale. And after we've made this easier entrance, me and Andy Evis, he's lucky to be here, to be honest, went down here to the end of this Eurobarus passage. And we were digging the boulder choke down there, and there was a chamber with a flat roof and a sort of scoop in the floor. But to get into it, you had to do a little squeeze to get into the chamber. So I went in and started digging some stuff up, put it on one side, and then Andy said, I want to go, I want to go, you see. He's keen, you know. <laughs> was keen, right. Anyway, in he goes to have his stint at digging in the floor of this thing, because there's quite a nice draft coming out. And suddenly there were some strange noises sort of groaning noises and things. I thought it was Andy to start with. And then suddenly, there was this slurping noise, and the whole roof of the chamber, which was about eight foot square, came down like a dirty great piston. And Andy spun round like a startled rabbit in this shake hole thing, and started to come back through the squeeze. And we were staring at each other, and the boulder came down, and it, it stopped on his back. And the reason it stopped was because there were some, I put the boulders at the side from the shako. So you're lucky to be here, young man. <laughs> I mean, the, the aftermath of the Mossdale thing was pretty dramatic, especially for some people. I mean, Ken Pierce's 1967 Berger expedition almost collapsed because a lot of the people, you know, they, they basically, their, their hearts weren't in it. You can't blame them, can you? after a thing like that, and uh, Ken, P Ken Pierce wasn't the easiest man to work with. But he did, uh, he did get through his sumps and things, yeah? But some people thought that this would virtually stop caving for a while. But we thought the opposite, because we knew that our friends who died down there, they wouldn't have wanted us to stop caving. So in fact, what we did in 1968 was we decided to have an expedition to Yorkshire. Because before that, we'd either gone to Mendip, Mendip, right? Some fantastic caves on Mendip. Or Ireland, again, fantastic caves in Ireland. But we thought, let's see what we can do in Yorkshire. And it turned out to be amazing. But we were lucky, I think. One of them was Sleets Gill Cave, at the end, of the, the end of the main tunnel, which is dead easy caving, really. You drop down into a lower stream passage here. And when we surveyed this thing way back in 1963, there was a lot of water coming out of this horrible little passage. It's about the size of a drain pipe. But when we surveyed it, it was about a third full of water. And it wasn't still water either, it was rushing towards you. Anyway, a friend of ours, Mr. Harry Long, he went there in a drought. And he said that the passage was passable because there's only a trickle coming out of it. So three or four weeks later, we went back with him. Uh, but it had rained meantime. <laughs> it wasn't a drought anymore. And this, um, I think what happened was, we were all traipsing up here, and then somebody had some light trouble here. And now I got myself an electric lamp. So I was Superman. I was impervious to anything. So I went ahead up here, 
and came to this passage. But now it was two-thirds full of rushing water. But for some, like, again, I think brain had probably been extracted. I set off up this passage, and once it started up it, you couldn't really stop. The only way to go up it was to actually push up against the roof so the water went underneath you as much as possible. Anyway, miraculously, after a couple of hundred feet, you could get out to one side and then up this thing and up this thing and up this thing. And then you popped out in this big stuff here, about 20 foot square, coming out of some. Then I turned round and started to go uphill up this thing. And it turned out to be this. It's a bit like the entrance ramp here, but twice the height and about four or five times the size. It's an incredible thing, quite unique in the Dales, from what I know. So that was number one discovery. Number two was in Gaping Gill. Again, in 67, we went along on the uh, Bradford meet, but we, we camped at Stream Passage Port. We didn't want to get under their feet. And they were exploring, which we'd almost found by mistake, but we'll gloss over that. Anyway, a week later, we were digging here. And we were looking for a link to Car Pot here. But the passage going that way was hopelessly choked, whereas the passage going this way was blowing a fine draft, and there was a rumbling noise. We thought it was a stream. Anyway, a couple of weekends of chiseling through this style choke, and we got through and dropped into far country. So that's the blowhole through here. And came to a 50-foot pitch in the floor. Thinking about it, because this, all this is really the continuation of Hensler's Master Cave. We've got to get down this 50-foot pitch. So we actually sent somebody back to get a ladder off Disappointment Pot, drop it down. But then we couldn't find a belay. The only way to belay it was to stick a boot with a foot inside it into the mud at the top and then put the belay around the boot <coughs> and go down the pitch. The worry was it was getting very close to Ingleborough Cave. See, this is the Ingleborough Cave. And here's the far country. In fact, the far country ended there at that time. So it's only about 150 yards from Clapham Cave. And Bob Jarman, who runs Clapham Cave, was, I think he wanted to put a gate on it or something. He was a bit worried he was going to have muddy cavers coming out of his cave. The far country really wasn't finished off properly. And the reason is that we, uh, we found this. We'd always been looking for, ever since the, uh, we were always looking for another way into the Black Kelt system. And Blackcliffe Pot was an obvious one because it, it, it was supposed to end very wet and tight and nasty. And now we've got wetsuits and electric lamps. We, uh, we thought we'd give it a go. And uh, it paid off big time. The chunk we found in 1967 was three miles long. But a couple of years later, we extended it yet again. Here's a Borough Falls chamber at the end. And by going through a horrendous choke down a 50 foot pitch, you end up in the, the next bed of limestone <coughs> running this way. Another mile and a half. Frank was saying there's a lot of potential. There's a heck of a lot of potential. Moss Hill Caverns, the water we know goes to Black Keld. The diving from Black Keld has now got back to about here somewhere. So it's heading in the right direction. Now it's actually going to about here, because there's a series of veins here between Mossdale and Lightcliffe coming across. So the water must drop on these to some extent. But what, where on earth? The water from Mossdale goes, God knows. There's a huge cave system under here. But that's for the next group. I think that's it.